Hi, I'm Todd Gannon, and this is the SciArc Channel. Tonight, I'm very happy to welcome N. Catherine Hales, the James B. Duke Professor of Literature at Duke University. What are you up to lately? Tell us a little bit about the new book. The new book is continuing the thread of inquiry that I began with how we think, uh, but it's taking it in a different direction. The title is a pun, so in my way of thinking in this book, I distinguish between thinking and cognition. Thinking, uh, as far as I'm concerned, is what happens in the conscious mind. Cognition is a much broader capacity mm -hmm. that extends beyond humans to other biological life forms and also technical systems. Mm -hmm. And so you are more than you think uh, refers to the neurological capacities that are not conscious in right. human um, cognit cognition, but it also is about the embodiment of humans and their embeddedness mm -hmm. in larger systems. Maybe just to kind of set up the conversation, give us an example. If humans did not have non-conscious cognition they uh, would be incapable of operating in the world. We need to be able to screen out tons of information before exactly. we start to think about it. And non-conscious cognition is what performs those tasks. Gotcha. So non-conscious cognition integrates body signals into coherent body representations. Mm -hmm. It can discern patterns too subtle and dense for consciousness to recognize. Mm -hmm and it is much faster than conscious processing. And so it operates on external stimuli and also body signals before they ever reach consciousness. Cognition also occurs throughout biological life forms. Oh, right. So I think that consciousness is widely shared among mammals, for example, mm -hmm. goes way beyond what uh, humans do in its range and its specificity. But when we get to organisms like nematode worms, which have no consciousness at all, mm -hmm. nevertheless, cognitive processing goes on. Right. And perhaps the most controversial area is in plant cognition. This is a relatively new area of research, but plant scientists are discovering that plants are capable of kinship selection, learning, memory, uh, and all kinds of capacities that if they occurred in organisms with brains, we would surely call them cognitive. So clearly this uh, distinction between thinking and cognition is important, or between consciousness and cognition is important. As you know, science fiction is full of um, fantasies about technical systems that have consciousness. My latest favorite is the film Ex Machina, mm -hmm. but we could name hundreds yeah. uh, in a few minutes. But to my mind, this somewhat obscures the fact that technical systems which are non-conscious are already cognitive and performing any number of cognitive activities that are becoming increasingly essential to human society. So I prefer to use the word cognition rather than intelligence because intelligence is so human weighted. Mm -hmm. Also the whole field of artificial intelligence um, is very specific and I don't want it to be confused with that. To talk about the cognitive non-conscious is, is not a new idea in the sciences. There's right. been research on that since the 1990s. Mm -hmm. Increasingly, there's research in plant cognition, as I mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, but it's a relatively new idea in the humanities. Right. In fact, I can't remember ever hearing or reading it in the humanities prior to beginning on this book project. One of the themes that has been part of your writing is the difficulty of scholars in the humanities communicating productively with researchers in the sciences. And one of the things that I think you've been very good at doing is building bridges between those two worlds. I'm right. very much rooted in the humanities. I'm a big fan of the humanities, but I think that the humanities have opportunities for 
collaborations with engineers, scientists, doctors, and so forth that haven't really been exploited because of the traditionally human-centered nature of the humanities. Tell us a little bit more about some of the new material that you're working on. I mean, I think this distinction between consciousness and cognition is a big one. So I started research on the idea of non-conscious cognition two or three years ago. Mm -hmm. Started reading some of the scientific work and so forth, and it seemed to me to have enormous potential. So the idea that a lot of neurological processing goes on below the level of consciousness and unconsciousness, mm -hmm. I think is a, a major theoretical discovery. So uh, I call consciousness and unconsciousness the modes of awareness mm -hmm. because in the so-called new unconscious, the new unconscious can be understood as a kind of broad environmental scanning. Like when you're driving and you're thinking about the class you're going to teach and suddenly someone in front of you stops and you jerk to awareness and mm -hmm. act appropriately, that's the unconscious communicating. And that's also my commute every yes, week. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, communicating in an easy fashion with uh -huh. consciousness. The psychoanalytic unconscious, the Freudian unconscious, can then be understood as a kind of subset of the new unconscious where some kind of trauma has intervened to disrupt that communication. Gotcha. But even so, the Freudian unconscious communicates through dreams, symptoms, and so forth. Mm -hmm. By contrast, non-conscious cognition is inaccessible to consciousness. No amount of introspection will make the processes available. Nevertheless, it has mechanisms through which it can either forward information to consciousness or, perhaps even more important, suppress information. So one of its functions is to keep consciousness from being overloaded right. with too much information. One of the issues is, is repression. Like we have to scrub out a lot of yeah. information in order to just maintain a sense of sanity. But I think it was Damasio that you cite in one of the recent essays that talked about the, also the necessity of a kind of recursive re-representation. So on one hand there's suppression, yes. on the other hand there's a kind of looping of representations and the representation of what's going on in the non-conscious seemed to be significant to forms of consciousness. Did I get that right? Yes, absolutely. So Damasio makes the strong claim that there is no consciousness without re-representation. Right. And that means that representation had to occur first elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And that's the function of, as he calls it, the proto-self, or as I call it, the cognitive non-conscious. Right. So part of what's involved here also is rethinking the whole definition of cognition. And this is an issue I struggled with long and hard before I arrived at a definition that satisfied me. And I'll just quickly give you that definition. Cognition is a process of interpreting information in contexts that connect it with meaning. Mm -hmm. And that definition gives me two things. First of all, it provides a very low threshold for what counts as cognition, right. enabling me to include computer programs, plants, and so mm -hmm. forth. But it also provides opportunities for scaling up to more and more complex cognitions. Right. And that happens through the kind of recursive looping that you just mentioned, mm -hmm. when representations by the non-conscious cognition become re-represented in consciousness. How does that kind of question of embodiment inform some of this, the newer ideas? The importance of embodiment enters here in the emphasis I'm placing on context. So as Shannon defined information, it uh, was context-free, which inevitably meant it was meaning-free. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't have context, there's no way to generate meaning. Right. If you have context, you can get meaning, but then you can't get a reliably quantifiable theory. In a sense, information and meaning are, in a way, at odds. They're at odds, but they're connected mm -hmm. when information is interpreted in context. Right. So those contexts can be very diverse.
To a plant, the context would include something like the chemical composition of the water it's absorbing, the angle of the sun, and so forth. For a human, the context would could be uh, much more abstract and conceptually oriented. But once you have a connection with context, then you have a way to generate meaning that is, however, specific to that context. So this way of looking at cognition denies the possibility of universal cognition. And it denies that possibility because of the specificity of context. One of the things that's going on in your writing, and one of the things that I think makes it so productive, is that you're, you're able to kind of wrangle a lot of scholarship from fairly far-flung places and disciplines and get them to kind of speak with each other. Yeah. Yes, and that's uh, crucial to this project mm -hmm. because there have been fields like uh, the emerging field of cognitive biology that is trying to make the argument all biological life forms have cognitive capacities, mm -hmm. a position I agree with. But even scientists working in that paradigm don't make the connection between biological and technical cognition. To me, that is absolutely crucial mm -hmm. to arrive at an understanding of cognition that will enable us to see technical systems as fundamentally cognitive. Right. And once you have a vision of cognition that enables that leap, then you have a way to think together biological and technical cognition, which increasingly interpenetrate to the point where they really can't be separated. Right. And so maybe as a, as a pretty simple example, that that allows us to see a termite mound and a trading algorithm as in some way comparable exactly. in terms of the way that they are cognizant. Exactly, and the termite mound also indicates that the cognitive agent can be the system as a whole, right. the individual within the system, or some combination thereof. Trading algorithms operate in the temporal range of about five milliseconds. Mm -hmm. By contrast, consciousness comes online 500 milliseconds after an event. That's a full hundredfold increase of the speed at which algorithms make decisions. Right. And so as trading algorithms occupy more and more of the trading activity, they're now estimated to be about 70% of all trading activity, mm -hmm. the ways in which the, the cognitions of these technical systems interact with human complex systems is an increasingly critical issue. And there is also uh, an opportunity in that conversation to talk about the architectural implications of some of this thinking. Given the incredibly short processing times involved in trading algorithms. It becomes significant where you locate the servers and having the server closer or further away. That yes. space, in other words, spatial proximity uh, matters. Absolutely. And that is maybe a fairly mundane seeming uh, architectural consequence of how close are your servers to one another. But from there, I think we can start, you know, you can begin to imagine other possibilities of the way that buildings begin to act like uh, cognizant agents, or actually are, in some way, conscious. Yeah, I know there have been buildings constructed that are permeated by computational media mm -hmm. and that can react in various ways to the actions of the people within them, for example. Mm -hmm. So that would be an example where you're creating a cognitive assemblage right. that includes human and technical components. But even if we go further back into the process of an architect sitting at her desk uh, with a computer screen in front of her, it's almost a paradigm example of a distributed cognitive system. Right. The software is carrying part of the cognitive burden, the human is mm -hmm. uh, directing that software in various kinds of ways, but uh, both are enhancing each other. Right. So to really grasp the entire cognitive process here, you need some way of putting the human and the technical together mm -hmm. in terms of an interacting whole. Buildings have a lot of sensors in them. 
Some of them pretty dumb, like a thermostat. Some of them a little bit more complex. Uh, but there's a lot of automatic information processing going on, and even fairly traditional uh, buildings. Is it important to be able to draw the line between call and response data gathering and something that is closer to cognition in the way you're describing it? Well, I would include in the cognitive realm a thermostat. Mm -hmm. Uh, so where I want to draw the line is between what I call material processes and cognitive activities. Okay. So a material process could be illustrated by a glacier or a tsunami or a sandstorm. Um, and those natural processes have an enormous amount of agency, but they can be understood as the sum total of the forces acting on them. And what they do not have is the ability to make a choice. So involved with interpretation is uh, the capability of making a choice. And in that sense, computer programs make choices all the time. They make choices at a fundamental level between is that a one or is that a zero, is that five volts, is that zero volts? But on much more sophisticated levels, they make choices about what word you intended to write and, right. and auto-correct your word and so forth. What algorithms are good at, let's say, is they're good at finding patterns, right? And it seems to me that they can be taught to interpret them, at least in some sense. Um, but again, I, I would almost come back to the thermostat, because in many ways the thermostat, a, a simple thermostat is more like a glacier in that the copper is either touching or not touching depending on atmospheric conditions. But maybe a nest thermostat is somehow has well, more let, choice Well, let me take in. the thermostat as an example and go back to that definition. Okay. So cognition is a process of interpreting information in contexts that, that connect it with meaning. Mm -hmm. So for the thermostat, the context includes should this mercury switch go on or off in mm -hmm. order to turn the heat on or off. Right. So it's, inter it's registering the temperature and it's interpreting that information to perform some action mm -hmm. and in performing that action it has a choice. Right. And so uh, for the thermostat, even a dumb thermostat, I would argue it's carrying on cognitive activities. But I think we're also on a very clear trajectory where all these technologies are becoming smarter mm -hmm. and they're becoming capable of making more sophisticated uh, right. cognitions and decisions. So since that is a pervasive tendency in the culture, that's one reason why I think it's crucial to rethink cognition from the ground up. In Harmon's discussion of, with, of the withdrawn, that I always saw that as kind of a license to say, okay, there's always something more, like you always get more. And to think of it in a more mathematical way, to say that, that infinity in some way equals stasis, uh, that, that you sort of preclude movement is a, is a, I hadn't thought of looking at it that way. Well, yeah. I agree that there's always something more. Right. And I also agree that no object can ever be known in its totality, mm -hmm. including all the perspectives from which it can be known. And right. in that, I agree with Harmon. Where I don't agree with him is in the idea that because you can't know everything, you can't know anything. Right. I think you can know a great deal awesome. about it. I also think he presents objects as more or less uh, static participants in the whole enterprise of scientific inquiry. But in my background as a scientist, that's not true of objects at all. They continuously offer resistance mm -hmm. to probing and uh, scientific experiments. And those resistances are in a, a very important and potent avenue for knowledge. Thanks very much, Kate. Thank you. Thank you, Todd. <laughs> Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time on the SciArc Channel.